Hello and welcome to another edition of the Cork and Taylor Wine Podcast. I have a cellar grunt, <laughs> the finest surfer in all of Napa, or at least Howell Mountain. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm kind of looking for the waves here and I don't see any waves in, oh uh, <laughs> in, in uh, Napa Valley. I haven't surfed in a couple of three years now. It's pretty bad. <laughs> Do you bike still? Because you used to oh, own a bike shop. Yeah, I bike uh, weekly. I'm I'm probably three to four days a week at, at best. Nice. And then uh, uh, every once in a while, I take a a week off for injuries or whatever. Nice. But, uh, yeah, that's that's my uh, main source of exercise. Nice. We got uh, Mike Dunn. Thank you, Mike Dunn of uh, Dunn Vineyards here at the. On, not here. I guess I'm here at the uh, Cork and Taylor uh, Wine Podcast. Thank you for joining us. Presented by no one, sponsored by no one, <laughs> probably listened by no one. You said you listened to oh, a couple I listened episodes. to. So that's good. Uh, so yeah. it helped the uh, Keenan. It helped the numbers. I like the. I listened to the one on Keenan. <laughs> yeah, and he's on the other mountain. Yeah, S- Spring Mountain. Dude. Yeah, absolutely. I once asked him, "Do you guys do you have a lot of water in uh, Spring Mountain?" Yeah, and he said, "Well, it's called Spring Mountain for a reason." <laughs> You know, it's interesting because uh, I, I didn't know his story, and uh, and I still don't know it in depth, but what I gathered from your interview is it's a lot of similarities to... Um, he did his father, you know. Yeah, yeah, working it. for your father, <laughs> then you, you're going to have some similarities, um, maybe different, um, like, financial aspect. Philosophies. But, yeah, um, and, and how the second generation, what they need to do or are forced to do or, or step into. Right. From... And slowly uh, taking some ownership and and the pride and joy of their and what's dad. Fu- it's what's funny is I golfed with him and his son Riley. Riley's now in the business. Riley's yeah. thirty one, really talented. Right. And you know Michael had his challenges with his father. Right. And and maybe saw saw things differently. And yeah. But he's really made the winery what it is, and it's cool to see <clears throat> a third generation. Yeah. In in trying to see Michael teach and whether Riley believe, you know, um, because the beautiful thing is we all have our own mind. That's probably good and bad. Yeah. (laughs) You know, mind is a terrible thing. Yeah, it is. (laughs) But it's a really kind of unique story. So your dad, um, so do you call, I mean, is, do you call him dad? I mean, I know know a little bit about your background, so I I should have asked you this before, but no, I'll tell you 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 point blank. My mom uh, and my biological father divorced when I was four. We moved to Davis. Uh, my mom started dating Randy when I was in second grade, and I didn't call him dad because I'd have scared him off. <laughs> but uh, around uh, Mr. Dunn, <laughs> <laughs> around sixth grade, I call him Randy. And around sixth grade, my mom's like, "Should I marry your Randy?" And I'm like, "Well, if you don't marry him, I'm gonna go live with him." Cause really? I, yeah, because you know, at that age, yeah. you need a, a male figure. Yeah. And I was kind of a smart ass in school, and and uh, you know, not a bully, but you know, kind of bored with school and. Uh, didn't have a, a male figure other than my mom screaming at me, and you know if I messed up. But uh, Randy, you know, was a motorcycle racer. Really, and taught me how to fix my bicycles. Um, I mean, I'm just always a bicyclist. Uh, Davis, if you know the town, is is a bicycle mecca, really. I mean, and so uh, you know, here was a guy that you know helped me with my soapbox derby, you know. And anyway, it was uh, a welcome um, part of our family, and then. You know, he was on the mission to start a winery, unbeknownst to him at that time. And we moved here when I was right after sixth grade, really. Um, and off off to the races. But he was making wine at Camus yeah. in 75. Um, so... And and he was doing that while he, you guys were starting work, you know, getting yeah. this vineyard. I mean, was it planted when you guys moved up Yeah, there? so we, he found this vineyard in 77 was when he purchased it, at the end of 77. It was planted in 72. And uh, then he found this place that we're st- sitting at right now uh, for sale, and Camus bought it. So we were the caretakers of this house here. 1890 it was built. And Camus decided uh, they were going to plant this field out here and then changed their mind after a year, and then we bought it back from them but we had to subdivide it into two parcels because we couldn't <coughs> afford it mm-hmm. so we got the two homes there's an old home there and this mm-hmm. ancient home here right and uh the winery started right underneath and 79 was the first release it was 600 cases and my, the neighbor next door saw us uh working the vineyard and he started leasing us in 79 his vineyard so he had six and a half and we had four and a half and that's what how and that's some of our best vineyard to this day it is our best vineyard 
both both of those. Wow. Matter of fact, the the last uh, reserve I made came from that leased vineyard wh- from when we replanted really old vines there. We plant replanted in '86 and '93. That went into the El Camino Reserve that we got 100 points from Galonia. I'm, all, I'm super pumped about yeah. that. But it's and a, that's a legitimate hundred points. Not like yeah. you have to pay for advertising. No, no way. Oh, did I did I say that? <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. No, we're <laughs> we don't have any money for that kind of stuff. Yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, it was a real honor. Uh, I mean, I've always noticed these old lots are just really stellar, but I've never wanted to rob them out of the Howe Mountain mm-hmm. um, until we started pulling out vineyards. And so uh, when I first started, I'm on my this will be my twenty third vintage coming up. I started back in 99, and my dad said, well, let's look at replanting the trailer vineyard. And it took us 15 years to finally make that move. And, you know, people out of the business think, well, why would you pull out such a great old vineyard? Well, the reality is that there was one out of every three vines still alive. And the planting spacing was 10 by 12, which now it's 8 by 4. So you're really um, not utilizing that space. And, yeah, you take three or four years to develop a crop again and it's expensive but um in hindsight that site is so special that even the young vineyards uh the young fruit there is is tremendous but yeah that old that old wine that comes off those old vineyards is it's really hard to replace so i started featuring these old vineyards as we replant and uh it's really simple stuff you know they just taste good <laughs> i mean you can taste mm-hmm. them blind you know, it's not some magic. So what you say is you don't work very hard. You don't do very much. You <laughs> show up easy. when you need to show up. <laughs> I, you just I, like. Yeah, yeah. I just ride my bike. And yeah, there uh, you go. But uh, yeah, after about, um, I don't know, 2013, I finally started to have to hire people to help me in the cellar because my upper back and my lower back got better and better. But I started having bulging discs and my, you know, getting numbness in my Yeah, fingers. that's always fun. Lifting barrels three high wasn't the best thing for me, yeah. uh, ultimately. And I've always been able pretty durable and get away with it, but like. This year at harvest, I did something dumb. I lifted macro bins three high out in the vineyard upside down to keep the water out of them and pinch something in my neck. So I was out for a month. <laughs> and like, go to the physical therapist. And he's like, dude, you got to like work into this, you know. Anyway, so uh, yeah, I'm 54. Randy's 74. He's only 20 years older than me. And um, I started back here in 99 when my mm-hmm. sister passed away. She was 20. Came Sorry home. To hear that. Uh, thanks. Right. She came home from Chico State with a cold on Friday night, and she was rushed to the ER Saturday, Ugh. and we uh, unplugged her Monday. And it's just what was the? Co- I mean, what uh, meningitis? Oh, you know, and I forget if it was bacterial or viral, but um, you know, it's it's more common than you think. And uh, uh, of course, my parents were completely devastated, and uh, in hind, you know. It, to backtrack, I had asked my dad if, if I could start working at the winery and, and learn to make wine from him, mm-hmm. you know, a year before. And he said, well, you don't want to work for me. You're, what you're, what you're, peaked that? What peaked that for you to think? To, maybe to I should com- finally get, get going and work okay. for the winery. Okay. Yeah. yeah um, well, I was in retail sales. Uh, I had my own re- retail bike shop. Yeah. And, uh, and really, I was more of a mechanic than a retailer. <laughs> and... Um, I was uh, on vacation with my wife in Mendocino. We went into a bookstore, and I picked up a book on wine. I started reading about my family. And, you know, my whole life people were telling me, you should work for your dad and work for nothing, and you should learn that. And I'm like, you know, that's <laughs> that's where I grew up. Those right. are my chores, you know. I don't want to work for my parents. They drive me nuts, right? Mm-hmm. But you read about it and the legacy there that, uh, you know, he's established. and you start It's phenomenal. I mean, this is, yeah. you say done, yeah. people know it. And I people think wine appreciate enthusiasts it. know it. Like no, no, yeah. wine people know it. <laughs> and the thing is, they know it's consistently good. For sure, I've never had it. <laughs> oh, oh, well, we'll, we'll we're going to remedy that. Yeah, yeah, we're, yeah, yeah, no, I've never had it. Everybody talks. Well, it's hard to find too. It's kind of early in the morning, but you know. who cares? <laughs> For you, I've been up since four fifteen. I was up at five fifty. My cat wakes me up at five fifty every morning. Bless her heart. I go back to sleep, though. Yeah, I, I stay up. You know what? Because I, I do the whole Akron, Ohio schedule. Yes. So when I go home, yeah, I yeah. didn't skip a beat. My yeah, wife doesn't hate me as much. Oh, yeah, totally. It's I a win-win. Um, so you, yeah. read this bu- you read this book. I read the, I'm reading this book. I forget. It was uh, was there British. pictures in it? No, I don't think so. But I love like... books with pictures in the middle. <laughs> do you, okay, books with pictures. Do you go to the middle and cheat and look at the pictures <laughs> totally. before you read it? I do, too. It really tells you how good the book is or not. Uh, yeah, it's uh, 
Well, you know, in hindsight, um, he was absolutely right. I did not want to work for somebody else. I was my own boss. I had friends in, that would come into the bike shop and say, you're never going to be able to work for someone else because I'm mm-hmm. kind of... Uh, um, you can say it. No one listens to this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kind of not crazy, but I'm I'm like get into people's sh- shit. You know, like, kind of an asshole. You know, people, people, yeah, a sensitive a asshole. I, I call it. You because, don't bite your tongue. Well, people want discounts, and I'm like, oh, you want a discount? You're gonna fucking earn it, right? Yeah. Yeah, you're gonna get abused. I, abused I, by I, me. I hope you don't don't do sales and marketing for the winery. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually much better at this shit now. And actually, I'm pretty nice to people that just wanted to buy stuff, and there was no strings attached other than, hey, what do you recommend? Okay, great. I'm really nice to those people. <laughs> Uh, bike shops are really tough to make a living, and I honestly yeah. was really nice, and I gave all all locals ten percent, and I gave all my friends ten percent. And reality is, that ten percent was what made the difference between yeah. paying your bills. And you remember not. what you said when I said I don't drink much? Yeah, it's called drinking the profits. Yeah, exactly. We don't have any profits. After so what we year. do here is that we make home wines, and all of our vineyard crew gets them. And really, we, yeah, we don't put labels on them. We just sometimes it's a blend of cab from leftover from bottling. Um, like when you rack all the barrels, you're going to have some sediment that you don't want to run mm-hmm. through the filtration system and that will let settle and then rebottle that. So we'll mix Napa and Howl together and just put, you know, really? cabinet. Oh yeah. And we don't, uh, I want some of that. Yeah. I mean, I think it's gone, great, but <laughs> I'll find but, something. <laughs> but yeah, uh, we make a little home Syrah, yeah. we make a little home Good for you. Syrah, we make a little home San Giovese. So if you, if you like the, if you like the employee, the person ah. more, do they get better stuff? No, they just all get it equally. I yeah. Get, yeah. It's just like the bonuses here, you know, you'd have to really screw up to not get, you know, yeah, yeah okay. a case of wine when you ask for it. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Matter of fact, gonna, uh, you're I gonna got send th- me a case of wine and empty bottles. <laughs> yeah, there you go. No corks in them you either. Send a case. Of, <laughs> um, actually, we've been selling or giving used barrels to a whiskey uh, company called Barrel Bourbon, and they have a done uh, aged whiskey. Really? And they've been sending that to me, and it's cask strength. It's like 121 proof. Put hair in your head. Oh my god! At first, when I tried it, I was like, "Wow, this is good," but. <laughs> oh my god I can't feel my feet <laughs> yeah and actually now I've developed an affinity for it and I've had to kind of like take a break because it's like yeah it's too strong and uh, you know you obviously you're supposed to have some self-control when you drink right that stuff but it's like oh so good anyway um so I, I've been giving some of that whiskey away now too oh with a caveat that it, take it easy you know they're like yeah yeah just on a little ice and you know I'm like okay <laughs> <laughs> contribute to your delinquency. Well, there's no ice, but a lot of whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, there, uh, as as you probably surmise, most uh, producers have plenty of wine around them, and it's actually a problem, I think, mm-hmm. for a lot of people in the industry. Um, Randy was told by one of his early professors at Davis, like, be careful of the sauce because mm-hmm. it 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 it'll catch you, you know, catch up to you, and. Uh, that's not usually spoken about, but you know, there's a lot of people. You can still make wine, taste it, and spit. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I mean, if you're around it enough, sometimes your brain just gets yeah. attached. So yeah, um, yeah. Um, back to uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, yeah, Randy eventually was let go by Camus after '85. And, really? And so he started uh, making a little more wine here and started consulting for other people. And um, does he still consult? Uh, not anymore. No. Yeah. Um, he, you know, back in the eighties he was doing a few, um, and he, you know, he's one of those hands off kind of guys and it's, you know, his, he knows what he's doing, but he doesn't tell you what he's doing. And, and so nowadays I think maybe that wouldn't fly, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, I think the late, the last one he did was Palmas in Napa oh, yeah. and he helped design that eight story cave and, and, uh, you know, they were just a no compromise, uh, eight story Gravity fed, just unbelievable. Uh, I don't know if you've been there, but no, it's I need to go. I mean, no expenses spared. Um, that's kind of yeah. like that's kind of like the new Napa now. It is. It's unfortunate, but that's. Yeah. I mean, I, it is what not, it is. Nothing against them, but it's like yeah. it's a lot of money. Yeah. You start with a lot of money, and yeah. it's different than the way maybe you know. Well, for sure, we were. Yeah. I mean, literally, that vineyard that Randy bought in '77 was forty thousand dollars. Isn't that crazy? It was 14 acres, but only four and a half plantable, and that uh, that was planted. Yeah, but what does an acre go for now planted? Well, minimum, I, I'm sure it's, well, 250 minimum, but I've heard high, like 400, you know, thousands. That's crazy. So, yeah, you can't buy in. You can't be a 
farm worker and go, hey, I want to start my own winery and I'm mm-hmm. going to buy some vineyard. No, not, not in that valley. Now, is there such thing as squatting rights? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's interesting with the, 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 the uh, land being so expensive and, and so valuable and so scarce, there's still so many ghost vineyards around that just aren't you, being... You just drive around and you don't even know what who they are, what they are. It's such anything. a waste of space. And meanwhile, we're tearing trees out of the hills to plant more you yeah. know, premium vineyard. Yeah. Um, you know, life's not perfect, but yeah, I see them on the way to Calistoga. Like, who owns this? Like, all you have to do, yeah, go squat on it, yeah. prune it, and take the fruit, right? Yeah. Uh, why not? But um, I'm thinking about it. <laughs> I found a good property just over the left shoulder of you. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah. So, so you know, people are moving to Lake County, and people are are, are producing, you know, up in Amador, and for for all yeah. good reasons. And uh, you yeah. know what? The big where I see a lot of people going because I was I was just telling you I was in Santa Barbara and Paso. Yeah. I think Paso is just going to explode. Really? I think there's so constellations in there now. You don't think it's too warm, or it's more blown varietal type. Tough, you know they're making. You know I tried some cabernets. They're yeah. making some pretty darn yeah. cab, good cabernets. Well, they have a coastal influence. Yeah, I'm sure. I think it's twelve miles off the ocean or nine yeah. miles off the ocean. That helps. I think that well the sites for that are producing premium fruit now are changing, right? Yeah. I, you know it's whether or not you believe in it or not. I would just. <laughs> you should grow some cabernet and carneros. <laughs> yeah. I mean, look, I make a petit sirah of my own brand called Retro. Yeah, we're going to, we're gonna don't tease that. We're okay, getting okay. there. Okay, but it's a cold there. spot right. for, for petit, and it's a blend. It has other varietals in it, and, and it kind of, I mean, I I think cold vari- uh, <laughs> cold right. climate stuff is intriguing. Right. You know? um, so you came, so you came full time here in 2005. No, 99. Well, oh, sorry, 99. sorry. Yep. 99, I started Part-time. three days a week, yep. and then harvest, and then in uh, 2004, I started full time. Okay. Uh, and, uh. I sold my bike shop in the end of 2003. So I was doing both. Yeah. Did you make any money from the bike shop? No. <laughs> well, I'm just but I nice. paid my loan back yeah. to Randy. Good and for the, you. And I bought my business partner out at three and a half years in, and we're still friends. You were able to make a living. We, uh, you know, my wife supported me. Yeah. Uh, she was right. working for her father, and she was able to support us both. Yeah. But also, I mean, we bought a house up here for 190000 back in uh, two, or, uh, 93. And you can't even buy a house for six or seven hundred now up here. I mean, there's a junker teardown on the road just came up for sale. I mean, yeah. like ancient, like yeah, tear it to it. the ground. Yeah. Nine hundred thousand. I mean, it's worthless. Nine hundred? Did you say dollars? Yeah. Isn't no, it crazy? Isn't it just crazy? Well, it's compl- well supply and, then, and demand. I guess we I may don't... not be able to get home insurance up here. You know, in the near future. Oh God! Yeah, we don't even want to get. Yeah, into let's. That. That's another. <laughs> so when did you start making making the wine? When did you kind of take over? Full so, winemaking duties. So I started in 99 and just was the seller grunt and just did whatever was said. And then we started developing some, some issues in the, in the cellar and the, in the way we, um, uh, our sanitary methods and, and, um, sulfur management. And so in 2001, I had to kind of, uh, f- uh, enforce some things that Randy, you know, clearly always did, but back to my sister's passing, you know, kind of took a step back and wasn't really uh, as focused and um so in 2002 i consider that my baby actually replaced the whole barrel program brand new barrels i got rid of all the old barrels trying to get rid of the botanomyces that had developed uh, in the cellar um went back to sterile filtering which i know people f- gasp at oh my god sterile filtration but uh if you have botanomyces it's much better to remove it right um and the sulfur levels, you know, I took the one day class on Britannomyces management and, <laughs> and like, oh, hey, we're not doing this, that, and this. Right. And, uh, and so, um, you know, time and time again, I've had to kind of take over stuff as it's not being done. And, and that's not a dig. It's just a kind of a natural, like, aging process, I think. And, and I really give a shit, you know, it's my livelihood and, uh. I knew what it was like to not make money. <laughs> uh, I mean, really. Me too. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I really don't want to be there. Um, right. So, you know, when problems arise, I, I fix them. That's I was a bike mechanic, you know, and um, I don't want to uh, rest anything away or you know take control or boot anyone out. I'm talking about my dad, but but there, when when we get mildew in the in the vineyard for three years, I need to step up. You know, like okay, what's going on? You know, and I actually probably am guilty of not stepping up sooner in hindsight. But once again, as I'm protecting, you know, this is his baby, right? Mm -hmm. I was most likely going to stay in the bike world and maybe try to get into manufacturing and stuff and still make no money the rest of my life. You know, I I didn't really know exactly where I was going, but the retail was, was, 
was really draining. Well, retail's especially a, with online. I mean, especially oh, now, now, any yeah. retail now. I mean, I have a, a friend that has a shop in Napa, and uh, I I always see you know talk to him and see how he's doing, and and you know it's it's they need pep talks. I mean, people are tough. Yeah. You know, restaurants, that's tough stuff. Yeah. Um, I came here and I was out in the vineyard bored because the bike shop was so intense, and you didn't even okay it's lunchtime oh shit day end of the day you know boom it was that quick sometimes mm-hmm. out here you're like. Huh, when's lunch? You know? <laughs> but you slow down eventually, and and uh, you start after about a week of pruning, you're like, oh hey, it's lunch. You know, I mean, it mm-hmm. you flow, it starts to flow, and uh, it's a much slower pace. But um, yeah, so putting out fires was just kind of what I'm good at. Like my sister says, uh, get shit done. You know, nice. And uh, and yeah, I'm proud of that. I'm not a um, uh, classically trained winemaker. I don't. I'm not particularly mathematical or chemist chemically <laughs> gifted. I, I learn what you know specialists know and and try to regurgitate it. But I do know how to make the wine. So and I do know how a lot about the vineyards. But I'm not. And nor is Randy. I mean, he's he's a he's a you know obviously a talented winemaker, and he you know learned the vineyard th- from uh, Charlie Wagner, Chuck's dad. Yeah. And and we continue to learn. I mean, never it, heard it's that name before. What? Char- I've never heard Wagner before Napa. Charlie Wagner. I'm just kidding. Yeah, right. <laughs> he was just a really, really uh, a great guy. He he was like a surrogate father to to my stepdad, and uh, he helped Randy and Chuck by allowing them to pick some late harvest uh, riesling and selling it themselves. Really? Yeah, and that yeah that was a um, seed money for for this place. And really? Oh yeah. That's pretty cool. And uh, both my sets of my grandparents helped us with uh, no interest loans, you know, that kind of thing. So even back then in in the late 70s, it still was tough to start without some help. But my dad was adamant to not have a bank loan. And so back to your statement, now a winery is, okay, let's purchase the winery, let's purchase, let's get the winemaker, let's get the vineyard. Manager, yep, in yep. the vineyard management, and let's put in the facilities, and it's going to be state of the art. Yeah, and, and they're hi- gorgeous. And hire someone from France. Well, yeah, you know, uh, <laughs> and you know what? Like yeah. I've said before, like I've gotten in trouble for quote disparaging that method of making wine, but the reality is that they're good people, and that you know they contribute a lot to charities. Yeah. And but it is different than. I mean, all, look, even the old wineries are ego-driven. I mean, my dad, for sure. I mean, you know, he he knew what wine should taste like, and he was going to make it better than everyone mm-hmm. else. And my step or my father-in-law was the same way, you know. Uh, nowadays, it's it's people that have already made their wealth somewhere else, right? Not always. I mean, Is your father-in-law in the wine business? He was. He passed away uh, a year or so ago, and uh, he had Robert Pakota Winery in Calistoga. I know that and, name. Okay. And, uh, you know, he did a lot of sales in Ohio, actually. Mm-hmm. The corridor there was a huge business for him. But mm-hmm. he did not so much. He wasn't cab-based, necessarily. He uh, he had a Merlot that was uh, pretty well received. He did have a good uh, cab, but he did things like Beaujolais. And oh, God. Mus- yeah. Muscat. <laughs> and, uh, but he was more of the uh, marketing flair. Yeah. Whereas Randy's the, you know, tractor mechanic. You know, they're... Very different in that way. Well, let me ask you this. What's the best advice your father-in-law gave you? Huh. And what's the best advice Randy ever gave you? <laughs> Hopefully there is some. some Randy, said, room. Randy said to me early on, don't get used to expensive beers. <laughs> <laughs> and I ignored him. Yeah. But back now I'm back to cheap beers. Modelo yeah. in the summer, man. Yeah, Modelo, baby. It's like, hits the spot. The most interesting man in Howell Mountain, Mike Dunn. <laughs> That's a, it's Tecate, isn't it? No, that's Dos Equis. Right. Dos Equis, yeah. When I drink, I drink Dos Equis. <laughs> when I drink, I drink Dun Wine. <laughs> what about your father-in-law? Oh my God, my father-in-law. That's a good question. You know, he was a, uh, he was kind of a philosopher. He had some interesting discussions. He was a real lover of uh, food and and family meals and. I think. Oh, you know what he told me? He's, uh, we were talking about uh, when Kara, my wife, wanted kids. Um, what, do, what do you think? And he's That's not like, good talking to your father-in-law about that. He's like, he's like, I think kids make marriage better, and I think That's it's the a truth. natural. Uh, that is absolutely the truth, man. And uh, you know, I, I, being the, you know, I wanted to race my mountain bike, and when we had our first kid, you know, that 
I didn't want that to cramp my style. And then my wife wanted another. She was in a family of three. And I'm like, wow, I really don't know about this. It's going to be a lot of work. Oh, no, it won't be. Isn't it awesome, though? Oh, man, our kids are our pride and joy, of course. Yeah. You know, um, Our daughter has a uh, part-time job. She graduated during COVID. Awesome. Great um, graduation party, huh? Yeah. Matter of fact, you know, I told her your graduation was better than mine. We Zoomed her, her professor. She's got honors, <laughs> right? I just got drunk in the stands at mine. I didn't your, your professors weren't there. <laughs> they weren't even there. Um, but she's got a part-time job with um, a woman in Napa researching um, uh, historical preservation. Cool. Uh, and she probably wants to go on and get her, her master's. And her, her good friends are up in Seattle. She went to Tacoma, P- okay. Puget, University of Puget Sound. Okay. Okay. Um, so she got kind of robbed on the graduation, but you know we'll return to normal here, yeah. and she'll be able to move back up there. And uh, she's she's the brains, you know. Uh, she could easily run the business side of this winery down in the future, mm-hmm. um, but she's not going to be the the winemaker. Do you see or do you see your uh, any of your children kind of coming back into the fold? Not yet. I mean, I I came back at thirty three for real practical reasons. Like I said, my sister mm-hmm. passed away, and I needed to help out. Mm-hmm. I also needed money. Yeah, and, uh, and there's the romantic notion of wanting to pursue the extension of this winery. But like my son is 26 years old. He's not really into producing alcohol. <laughs> not yet. No, he's the, and he's an idealist. And um, and honestly, he doesn't want to be around uh, the family dynamic with me grumping at him if he's yeah. late or if he didn't. So do what some, do you do down the road? I mean, you've, you know, obviously you're young enough to be doing this for a while, but. I probably got another 20 years in me, you know, yeah. um, but my, right now my MO is to get good people here that can do it. And then, you know, I hate to say a board of supervisors, but you know, the family, see, I have my sister too, Christina, and she's got two young kids and she's going to want to be back involved in the winery okay. at some point. So, but also once again, Will she, she have to interview for a job, <laughs> <laughs> send a resume, no. <laughs> cover letter. <laughs> but she, she hears it from me if she doesn't. Toe the line. She so the I'm youngest or the oldest? Youngest. Yeah. So you're so, the boss. So uh, I'm tough on her. Yeah. And she takes it like a, a the tough chick that she is. She's into CrossFit. She's 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 know, a badass. She's pretty badass, but she's you know very fortunate and and it's thankful to me that I'm the one dealing with the business, and at some point she's gonna have to return the favor, right? <laughs> Um, and she's, she knows that. <laughs> hey, you see that barrel? Go lift it. <laughs> yeah, right. That's what your CrossFit training is all about. Exactly. Um, yeah, luckily she's, yeah, uh, she and I get along really well. She defers to me when I get angry and, and I'm only, you know, I only care for her, her well being. but I feel like in some ways I have to be her, uh, parent. I'm 15 years older than she is. Mm-hmm. And, uh. She's the baby of the family, and when they when they lose the middle sibling, she gets treated in a different way, you know, and it's to her detriment sometimes, you know. So I end up being that asshole, sensitive asshole, saying, "Hey, uh, you know, this has to happen." Right. And she's she's right there, and awesome. and, I, and her husband is is fireman fireman of the year. He stayed with me in the second evacuation this really? year. Really. Yeah, they gave him a radio, and that guy was worked his ass off for for twelve days up here, um, and you know we're all on each other's side. It's it's really fortunate because a lot of family dynamic, as you know, gets really sour a generation or two. Um, yeah, no one likes me and my family. No one listens to this <laughs> podcast even. Well, that's a whole nother story. <laughs> I but, think uh, I should interview myself. That'd be a go. great <laughs> episode. <laughs> But you know, I'm 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 not trying to. Right. Uh, uh, I'm obviously getting pretty deep into this because it is my life. But um, I think we're in that position where we've got enough family members that will maybe nobody will replace me in the sense that I'm trying to replace. Randy. You're irreplaceable, honestly. Yeah, right. <laughs> Let's be honest. <laughs> um, I think it will be different. Like I have a kid working for me now. He's been here a year, and he can run that cellar, no question about it. And he's, you know, he's been at a couple. Um, fairly prestigious wineries that are similar to us. Ridge, yep, um, awesome. Joseph Love Swan. Yep. Uh, he went and did a, a internship in uh, Cote Roti, and uh, so you know I have a, a really good um, cellar guy and assistant winemaker who could easily, uh, you know, mm-hmm. take charge. I guess um, from the business aspect, that's kind of what I've had to focus in on more. 
it's not really my natural uh, interest, but I've had to put out fires financially. You know, we had a big downturn in the economy, eight, nine, ten. Mm-hmm. That really caught us off guard. And my dad had bought a lot of land to keep it from being developed. And uh, so there wasn't really this um, culture of uh, um, financial planning and pro- pro- or projecting and where are we at, you know, cash flow wise. Right. <laughs> and uh, none of us want to do that shit. Right? No. So I, I've, believe, I believe me, no one wants to do that. <laughs> so I had somebody who was doing some of that for me, but he had to move on and be a parent uh, in Texas, and that didn't work. So I'm stepped back into the business side of it, and I'm actually better at it than I think, you know. But you have to do that, right? You have I mean, to. at the end of the day, whether you you have someone doing it, a CFO or a controller or whatever, you still have to be doing it. And we have this office manager who wears so many hats, and she's, you know, incredibly in tune with everything going on here, but it's getting her to express those things to me so that I know what's going on. Mm-hmm. And in the past, it's not not happened. But right. like when I owned my bike shop, I knew every day what the cash right. register counted out at and what we owed. And, you know, so here it's we've got a little more um, leeway. Obviously. A little bit more moving parts too, right? Yeah. And so, you know, one of the big things for us this year is we've gone from having a full-time uh, vineyard crew ourselves to hiring um, crews to come in. And and actually treating the vineyards more, not I wouldn't say professionally, but uh, more accurately and um, uh, profitably. So we would keep our guys busy all year long cleaning the forests, and we would do thing, we have them do things that you know to keep them busy. Um, when the reality is that really there's four months off vineyard work. That's a, that's a lot of money, and when you pay an in insurance. Yeah. You know, a couple grand a person in insurance a month, right? This is expensive. Mm-hmm. So um, this will be the first. We started having a hiring spray people to spray about three years ago, and it's expensive but but very precise and, and effective. And now this year I'm going to be hiring crews to prune and tie. And Good. So it's, 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 uh, it was really tough to let our guys go. They're like family, right? But, um, you know, we're looking at maybe no 2020, so... You have to start cutting costs now. Right. So what you're saying is, I'm getting no free wine, and you're not going to give me a job. <laughs> you can work for wine, but that's illegal, right? <laughs> you got to be paid. No. Um, who's going to know? Yeah. Right. Exactly. <laughs> that's true. Well, let's just take a quick break with uh, Mike Dunwin. We'll be right back. All right, we're back with Mike Dunn, and I want to talk about retro sellers because retro sellers is totally different than Dunn Vineyards. Correct. It's, it focuses on other varietals, um, for one thing. But but there are more similarities there than maybe evident in that, um, well, uh, backtrack, we started um, buying fruit from my dad, uh, Petit Syrah, that he was selling. He literally bought this vineyard in 92, I think. Petit Syrah on that vineyard was planted in 80, and he sold it for uh, 10 years to various producers. And I said, hey, I want to buy it in 2002 and he he forgot and sold it out from underneath me so in 2003 i said um no no i'm serious about this and and i said it's not charity i'm paying for it i'm you know and uh he said you give me a friends and family discount yeah (laughs) you probably paid more for it probably no i no actually i get it i mean i i don't get the free fruit free that's for sure right but uh um he said to me, classic advice, it's going to be hard to sell. And I said, ah, don't worry about the sales. I'm good at sales, right? Yeah, well, it's hard to sell. <laughs> He's right. It's a great grape. Hey, it's, it's, it's grape. easier to sell than Merlot right now. Well, yeah. Let's be honest. Uh, it was interesting hearing Michael Keenan talk about here's Merlot. They really likes Merlot, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, Merlot, Merlot's been vilified, but un, unjustifiably so. Mm-hmm. But we don't grow any Merlot. We don't grow anything but cab. Sauvignon. We don't have any other uh, Bordeaux variety. I saw some Riesling in there. <laughs> yeah. I saw Riesling. And I saw a Pinot Noir grape. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, <laughs> Just so, one grape. <laughs> so uh, I always would, we always had a barrel of Petit Syrah in the cellar. And I, when I would rack it, I would taste the wine. And I'm like, man, it's really intriguing to me. that di- It's a different kind of fruit. And it's a you know really robust wine. Like people think of done Cabernet as tannic. Oh, my God. Try Petit Syrah in a barrel. It just blasts your, your cheeks off, yeah. you know. So... Uh, my, my wife wanted to work less and, um, 
I wanted to make wine that my dad didn't tell me how to do. So I call it my master's program. So right after kind of solving some of the issues and done, I started doing more experimentation with retro fermentation techniques and yeast selections and barrels and uh you know, I had to develop a label, uh, and the big, big thing, spending your own money on this shit, not somebody else's money. sucks, huh? It sucks, and it's scary. Yeah. So you don't do things necessarily uh, as inventively when it's your own money. but And, you know, the reality is it taught me so much about why I'm making that. I mean, it's just invaluable to me. Like my, my retail experience in the bike shop, dealing with customers and learning basic accounting and, you know, customer relationships and budgeting uh weren't necessarily needed here at first it wasn't until later that some of that you know ability to rub two nickels together helped you know but but do doing the wine on my own with my own money and um you know being hung out to dry is really uh eye-opening and it benefited done tremendously because we've changed our yeast we've changed our barrels uh, we've done much more marketing kind of stuff with these release uh, special reserve releases that have really taken a brand that's the price never changed for five years, for instance, to all of a sudden throwing some wines out there that are three times the value and selling them immediately. Um, and read the tough part about having a, 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 a long term business like this is your mailing list dies literally. But, um, we're on our 40th bottling this this wow. this summer 40 40 <laughs> so people that were on our mailing list excuse, yeah, excuse me, you know in 81 that were in their yep. like my age now <laughs> aren't drinking wine if they right? are they're drinking like pinot noir right, right. It's a little bit exactly softer. and then also th- keep in mind there were 70 wineries back in the day and now there's 700 in Napa alone and back to you know these people have sales force we don't there's nobody here on the f- horn, you know, calling up accounts. So uh, when the downturn in the economy hit in 10, 11, or in 8, 9, 10, uh, we had to wave the white flag kind of saying, hey, we're here. Not by discounting, actually raised our prices. This is bizarre. And we talk about this in you know, other salespeople. You actually have to raise your prices to get respect. It's, I mean, I'm, I'm not talking a thousand. Don't bucks say that because I'm in distribution. I know. I personally I hate you. <laughs> Randy and I, all of us, we, there's no way we want to spend more than a hundred bucks a bottle of wine. Right. That's just ludicrous, right? It, but you know what? I mean, there it, he is right there. Yeah, the man, the myth, the legend. He's just walking. <laughs> he's walking around. Randy, he's just walking. He's, he's like, got why two is... hips. He's got three uh, a bypass, triple bypass. He's, oh my god, he's just going, man. He's in great shape. He rides his bike. Yeah. Um, I don't know where he's going, but he's just going. <laughs> oh, he's somebody's down there. He's talking. To yeah, you. you know, I think the problem is, I've seen in the distribution side. Well, let's say you're selling something for fifty bucks. Yeah, and, and you sell a little bit. Well, the winery calls and says, "Hey, we got to raise our prices." Right. Okay. So then we put it up five dollars. Right. And you sell more of it, it's, and then this is, hasn't happened, but or it goes up twenty five dollars. Right. And you sell more of it. It's like, there's something wrong with right. us. No, that's exactly what I'm talking now, about. Now, it doesn't happen all the time. No. But I think in Napa, when you have Napa on your label, yep. it's a little bit different. It's like liquid gold, right? I mean, right. if you've got Napa, and if you've got a good reputation. So so backtrack to retro, and Petit Sera, we released it at 40 bucks. Guess what it's at now? In, 25. No, it's at 45. <laughs> and then people are like, oh. You know, it's but that's like, kind of a sweet spot for for Petit Sirac, kind of. Yeah, no, it's for kind sure, of a sweet spot. But you know what? I mean, 50. I'm jealous, but Turley can get 99, or and yeah, Schaefer but, Relentless, you know. That, but that's not. It, it's, yeah, it, but Schaefer Relentless isn't that Syrah? That's not Petit Sirac, is it? Probably right. I think there's some Petit in it. But it I, it I used to be Syrah, and they yeah. couldn't sell it. Right. So they're Relentless. Oh, okay. I mean, then change the name. So, I found that making rosé was more profitable than making the Petit Sirac. <laughs> Yeah, right. Well, first of all, if you're going to start I would have a, never, I would have never thought so. There's so many damn rosés. I know, but we don't, if you make a small quantity like we do, right? And it's from a rare grape, you know that kind of thing. But yeah, I mean, in hindsight, you don't start a business based on a wine that you really need to age in barrel for 32 months, like just like we do a done, and then bottle age for years mm-hmm. more than done. It's not the best. That's uh, just money sitting in a barrel. Oh yeah, I, I so I learned all kinds of stuff with this this production, but. The artistic side of it, the label design and the, um, the making of the wines in the style that I like. I like acidity. 
I like uh, red fruits, and I like uh, I, don't, I wanted to tame the tannins in the petite to where it's considered somewhat of an elegant petite sirah, that or even not feminine, but um, you know along those lines where uh, you can kind of surprise people that you know they just think of it as a ball buster, or bruiser type of wine. And that's not what we're doing here, and. Um, uh, and do you just make the petite? You make a rosé and a petite syrah. So what I make now is I um, I make that petite syrah. I make a syrah. I planted syrah at my house, and sixteen was the first release, and that's uh, quite a bit different treatment in the cellar than the petite syrah. Petite syrah takes a hundred percent French oak, thirty two months in barrel. The syrah is uh, less than twenty percent new oak in in eighteen months, um, and much more approachable early on. And then I make a Zin. I, I kind of ran across a vineyard in uh, Child's Valley, a 40-year-old uh, dry farm Zin vineyard. Picked the fruit, and you know it was just killer acidity, and it had really good color. And I, I didn't, I don't get to make Zin much, but the Zins that I drink or have drunk aren't really the style of wine that you know, I, I like to drink. And so I thought to myself on a lark, why don't I just buy some of this and make some, you know, lower alcohol zin with without wood? Mm -hmm. So, oh my God, that was really fun. That was that was a lot of fun. So I had I was able to buy the fruit for four years, and then this year um, every, uh, they tore out the vineyard. But I was going to buy from Green and Red, and I'm going to put a plug out there for Green and Red. That's right out in Child's Valley. You know I'm going there next, right? Are you really? Yeah. With Ray and uh, Tobin. So I haven't gotten to meet them yet, but I have. Uh, I was going to buy fruit from them this year, but the first fire started right on their flanks. Do you want me to put in a good word for you? Yeah, please. Okay. Their vineyards are gorgeous. Oh, I know. Three and vineyards. Yeah, it's really interesting. Her father was a sculptor. So her sculptor s uh, professor at UC Berkeley. So Jay bought a bicycle from me when I had the bike shop. Oh God. And and it was like the cheapest mongoose, and he drove that thing into the ground. He was a super cool guy. Yeah. And uh, I'm going to tell him you ripped him off. <laughs> oh, he's passed away. Yeah, no, I'm sorry. Um, but uh, yeah. And then he got his neighbor, uh, Isley, to come over, and she bought a bike. And uh, and it's another great vineyard. I'm going to put a plug out for yeah. Isley. They're just right. I'm, I'm going there after that. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so Child's Valley is just really kind of a, uh, you know, it's like how Mountain. It, yeah. I, don't, I don't It's not like how Mountain, but it's 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 old. You mm -hmm. know, it's like it's oak trees and scrub, and it's just got this kind of cool. Horrible microphone. internet reception, phone oh, reception. Terrible, yeah, yeah. It's great. And they just got devastated by the fires of course but yeah. um got to meet with green and red winemaker who's not there now he moved off to new york to make wine which is kind of cool and um just terraced hillsides with this beautiful zen vineyard and mm -hmm. they have syrah too mm -hmm. so i'm looking forward to meet to working with them this coming year cool. but um you know zen's not one of those another one of those rivals that you're like oh let's make some money right and you know my zen is 14 9 14 7 14 9 and my dad just thinks that's just horrifically alcoholic but the reality is zins are 17 yeah um but it, uh i look at it as uh, i also don't get to work with pinot um but i look at it as similar to pinot and the, the style of wine i want to make is similar to that with it's a thinner skinned not tannic you know with, with interesting varietal characters you don't mm -hmm. usually get um and even some green characters which i'm not really afraid of i'm not right. like uh, but the pursuit of balance green i'm not that far over but um I, in other words people drink to like the zen or like i don't like zen but i like this that's cool mm -hmm. you know that that that's exactly what i'm doing right um so do you like it i mean do you i mean you don't done is not a, a heavy alcoholic like no. levels no do you Matter almost like pull it out we do we uh on certain vintages we we've had to remove alcohol how do you do that well, you can do it a lot of different ways. Yeah, okay. the, the traditional way is to add water at fermentation. Is it common? Oh, to remove alcohol or to add yeah, water? To remove uh, alcohol. It is more common than people would admit, for sure. Yeah. Um, it's a stylistic thing as well, but in the past, for Randy, it was a taxation issue. 14 yeah. and above. Was, oh, I believe me. Was more I believe me, I know distribution. I'm and, an and, Ohio and, baby. And, and so Randy, keep in mind, his formative years were at Camus when they got gondolas of wine or mm -hmm. grapes, mm -hmm. and they hosed them out with water because people weren't paying a lot of money for wine, and they weren't going to pay the extra for the 14.2 or 14.3. So he's always, you know, his palate really aligns along that 14 and lower. Um, so, you know, certain vintages, I think 04 was the year that we really got warm weather and we removed about a percent. Wow. Because you're picking for flavors, and some when you have heat spikes, 
uh, the sugars climb quickly, but the hang time's not quite there. The the flavors aren't quite, um, you know, ready. Mm -hmm. So what normally people in California do is they add water at harvest, and we do as well, but then you're diluting the wine, right? Right. But in the presence of the skins, you actually could say, well, I'm just replacing what's desiccated out in the vineyard. Um, I prefer to not add anything. I mean, obviously, most winemakers will will say that. But the practical aspect of some years, we have, you know, really sweet grapes. And mm -hmm. um, with climate change, that, that can be up or down. I mean, we've had right. some cold years, too, right? Mm -hmm. And some wet years. And Anyway, so um, actually how we do it, if we... Um, if we feel like it needs to be below 14, or Randy likes to do that with the Howl Mountain for sure, so I'm honoring him, even though I hate doing it. <laughs> it's a lot of work, it's expensive, blah, blah, blah. We actually send out a couple thousand gallons in a truck and send it to a, a company that has a reverse osmosis machine. Wow. And so they filter it. And then we bring back the de alked wine, at, it's like at 7 to 8%, and then we blend that into all of our lots. Uh, you know, sort wow. of, yeah, and it's so it's a lot of work, and my OCD bells start going ding, ding, ding. If we don't get the you know the right <laughs> blend, uh, also I think it it shuts down the Howl Mountain for a bit too. So, um, but your wines are kind of built to cellar too, right? For to sure, a certain extent. Yeah, you know, most mountain AVAs share the same types of soils. We have Aiken stony clay, you know, iron rich soils. Uh, the vines. Like Michael Keenan was saying, the vines struggle to produce, you know, may, they have more water than we do, but usually your, your berries are smaller in the mountains, so you have more color, more pigments, more tannins, more, you know, all the things that contribute to aging. Uh, if you pick uh, with a, a, enough acidity, that helps with your aging as well. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, we produce two to three tons an acre, uh, very minimal crop um, load. Vines are stressed, and so they may not be elegant, off the bat, um, which has been one of my major projects was to try to make done approachable early. And that was cleanliness and barrel selection and maybe not pressing the hell out of it as much and, and things like that. But it's still a rough, you know, baby, right? <laughs> and uh, Isn't all children though? Yeah. Yeah. Starting out. I mean, you think they're beautiful. And then you look back in the pictures, you're like, oh, wow. Yeah, that's <laughs> like people. photos of me as a child. It's like, oh, my mom <laughs> thinks I'm the greatest thing in the world. Man, I was fat oh, yeah. and ugly. Oh, my I kids, still am. <laughs> my kids still make fun of one of my pictures with big fat <laughs> jowls with my hand perked <laughs> under my chin, big blubbery lip. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Thanks. But uh, uh, yeah, so our, our wines are always known for the long haul. But I think we got a, maybe a little unfair rap on how tannic we were. I don't. I have a house palate, so tannins are part of what what I like mm -hmm. in a wine. But I mean, there were some vintages that Randy made that might have been pretty monolithic, you know. But there were, I mean, those wines are beautiful now in the '80s. Um, but as you know, he's aged, and the you know vineyards have uh, been replanted, and they're cleaner clones. We're we're looking at riper fruit in the past, so it's a little more difficult to get those under 14. My argument is 14.5 can be balanced wines. The reality is the 14.5, you know as a distributor, maybe you don't, but there's a big leeway there. 1%. Well, it's a half above, or what it used to be, a half above 14, but people don't adhere to that. So we've actually tested wines. High is 16.3 with 14.5 on the label. So that's one of his huge pro, uh, pet peeves. I'm a little more uh, laid back about it. If it tastes balanced to me. So it's 1.8% higher. This one example wow. was. And that's that's getting into a legality issue probably, you know, truth and... and right. Anyway, but it's not crossing the port. I think it's like the IRS. After seven years, they can't come after right. you. Right, and it's not crossing so the it was, port. So what was that, 1992 maybe? Yeah. <laughs> Just sort of random. it was that vintage actually. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, it was four, a really warm year. You got 17 years, so you're good. <laughs> it wasn't us, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, you know, uh, if you get into the fortified spirits, that's another taxation right. issue. So. Um, and sparkling and all. I mean, it's yeah. it's crazy. So now I are under the, uh, I guess the the de the demarcation zone now is at sixteen, which is, or maybe it's fifteen. I forget. I, I yeah. Numbers don't make any sense to me anymore. But anyway, that fourteen line is no longer present. But when your wine was uh, hovering above and or below fourteen, the TTB gets really weird with you, and they don't yeah. give you any 
leeway. It's a it's a classic example where government just fucked up, right? So if you're 14, you do eh, not talk bad about the government. Oh, I on know. The Cork I know. and Taylor Wine Podcast, please. They're a bunch of bean counters. <laughs> In, in the TV. You do not talk bad about the work. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so. <laughs> Let's talk politics. You want to talk religion or politics? Ooh. <laughs> yeah. We want to talk, but I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's, well, anyway, so, right. so uh, I think the focus shouldn't be on that number. Mm-hmm. And, but on the other hand, um, we firmly believe that lower alcohol wines are um, preferred mm-hmm. for, for the ageability. For the palatability, the food friendliness, um, versus the more rich extracted, uh, as my dad puts it, aperitif style wines, and and just simply pair it with a meal, and you can prove it to yourself. Some of these wines are delicious before and after, but when you're, so he's more the traditionalist. Like a, he when he drinks old wines, they're old California, like Ridge and uh, Chateau Souverain and Martin wow. Ray, or they're French, and they usually have some funk, and they usually have acidity. And they go well with, you know, savory foods. They're not cloying, you know. But there's a, you know, a huge chunk of Americans in particular that really love those rich extracted yeah. cabs. And that's unfortunately kind of become so monolithic in California, these cabs, particularly Napa. They're just really, really rich and big and bold. And they get great reviews. And, and that's picking them ripe and higher alcohols. And, um, you know, so... We can be the outlier with, along with some others that, that choose not to do that. Yeah. But it is a struggle to get ripe fruit with really healthy vines and not have those resulting higher sugars. In other words, our old vineyards could sit there at 22, 23, 24 bricks for weeks. Now, with the young replants, we can see a two bricks or more increase in one week. And boom. Boom. You got to pick it if you want to keep your alcohols under 14 naturally. That may not be realistic unless we can, you know. I I mean, we have some vineyards still that we haven't replanted that have viruses, like red blotch, and those don't get above 24. And and usually people pull them out as a response to, you know, we can't get these things ripe and they're not mature enough or uh, the flavors aren't developing. Uh, I'm almost curious if the red blotch doesn't help a little bit in some cases. I know that sounds kind of unscientific but um our diseased vines made really damn good wine not necessarily red blotch but all kinds of different things leaf roll uh anyway yeah so the vineyards the drive in the vineyards to make clean uh vines you know uh, prolific rootstock and clones is not helping that higher alcohol uh production of wines um but once again, what it comes down to, as we spoke earlier, we all are here to make a living. Supposedly. Supposedly. So if you put out a wine that, uh, say you said, I'm going to start a winery and I'm going to make a wine so tannic and and closed down that's going to take you 20 years before you, you can really enjoy it. But man, that'll be the best that's wine. That's called an investment. Yeah. But that will be the best wine you've ever had in 20 years. Good luck. Yeah. But that's kind of what Randy did. Yeah. And that was a different world back then. People put their wines down. Nobody drank wines upon release. You bought them, um, what, what's the futures? Mm-hmm. Bought them even That's the four- biggest scam. Oh, God. <laughs> Give us your money and we'll send you the wine in three years. <laughs> then it shows up in five years. Oh, shit, I didn't order that. <laughs> but you did charge my credit card. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Like uh, a friend of mine, Les Barons, makes Barons Hitchcock, and mm-hmm. uh, you know Heard of that, he's yeah. like, "Can't we all just get along?" Because my dad was like, you know, anti high alcohol wines. I'm like, "Totally!" Like, you drink a, a glass of Les's wines, and they're you know hedonistic, fruit driven. People enjoy the hell out of them. I don't have a problem with that. But I think the thing is, it's all subjective, right? There's sure. people that don't like your wines. It just is, okay? There's people that don't like me. Oh, absolutely. Probably a lot more people than don't you, like your wines. You know, they probably should have their head examined, but, you know, yeah. that's for another... I, I think I, I'm, I look in the morning every day, I'm beautiful, I'm skinny, <laughs> and everybody loves me. <laughs> it I'm is kind bad. of a shock. It is kind of a shock, but if you yeah. haven't made any enemies in your life, what's that saying? You know, it's yeah. like, if everyone likes you, you're doing something wrong, you know? I mean... I've never heard that. <laughs> uh, something like that. Anyway, try I to wouldn't know how better. that works. If nobody it. likes you, then you've done, also done something. Yeah. Right? But, uh, yeah, uh, for sure, and... Um, 
I mean, we just had a call, uh, somebody we had to reach out to asking if they wanted to, the new release. And they said, no, you know, the last one I got from you was 14. It was terrible. And we're like, so you want to be removed from the list? Yes. Okay, cool. You know. <laughs> I hope you die. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No. Uh, quit wasting our time. Yeah. A case a year is all we ask. No. <laughs> Yes, would you like uh, 15, 16, 17, 18? <laughs> so, so, yeah, so in 18, so one of the things we're known for is tannins mm-hmm. and ageability and lower alcohol wines. I would, I would like to say more balanced, maybe, but the other thing we're known for is our shitty wax covering that everyone hates, right? Yeah, cut those hands. So, that's why, that's why we're not trying anything right now because right. you can't open them. Right. So, <laughs> In 2018, the, the oh, wines, hot off the press, get ready. This the is, wines this that is we're um, going to be bottling this June are all going to have foils on them with a, f- a 40th anniversary logo. Ooh. So I expect either profusive praise and a couple naysayers, or a lot of naysayers, or and everyone's going to freak out. But the problem with the wax is it takes a long time to apply and it's really brittle. And mm-hmm. if we change our wax formula, which I did for the El Camino release, that reserve. It's slower, even slower to wax, and it's really tough. Like you have to uh, pry it out with the, the pry bar, but it doesn't chip. Just use the rabbit. Yeah, true. So um, the foil, it's f- bottled, foiled, and we can get it down to the co-op. Whereas normally we keep the Howl Mountain on premise, and then we wax it a couple pallets a day. If we change the wax, it's going to be one pallet a day. And in eighteen, we have a lot of wine. We have like three thousand cases. That's going to be months. Yeah. And um, so, anyway, we'll see how the experiment goes. But you heard it here first. Yeah, fantastic. <laughs> Hard hitting news. I think this is a good segue to be done. Okay. okay. Hey, you like that done? <laughs> <laughs> no pun intended. Michael or Michael. I called you Michael. You can I call apologize. Me Michael. Yes. Okay, that's weird. You can call me Mikey. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate you coming on the Cork and Taylor Wine Podcast. Uh, it's been an honor and a pleasure. Uh, you're doing some fantastic things. Keep up the great work. Thank you. We are. This is probably a good segue. We're going to do a little uh, bonus contact with uh, Mikey, uh-huh. Mikey Likey. We're going to really uh, uh, rib into him a little bit and have some fun. So <laughs> thanks for listening. Just remember to subscribe, rate and review, tell your friends, uh, follow us on Instagram, Facebook at Clubs and Corks, support us on Patreon, and uh, appreciate it. Have a good one. We'll see you next week or next time. <laughs>